When Jesus said that he came to give you life and life more abundantly, he meant in the here and the now, because life without God can be is a living hell. Yeah? Yes or yes? So, um, I've had my fair share of bumps and bruises, and um, I really make it a point to uh, not pass judgment um, because I've lived through a lot of things. So uh, my hope really is that I, I'm not going to go back here and preach to your young people. I'm just going to share and be available. So um, take heart because God is um, in control and Jesus is on the throne. So our future is pretty well set in stone. And uh, sometimes we just need a friendly reminder of that, that no matter how weak we feel, it's in our weakness that he is made strong. So uh, 30%, 5%, 50%, I'll take whatever I can get. But in the meantime, we're going to go um, have some fellowship in the back. And uh, if you feel free to join us, everyone's welcome. So, okay, never mind. Everybody's got to stay here and listen to Dad this morning. So, <laughs> before you leave, young people, um, James, come on up here, James. James is our godson from China. Um, Y'all welcome him. He's been uh, staying with us during the Christmas break because he's a student at the University of Florida. He's the most, the smartest kid at the University of Florida, I have to say that, and that's not just bragging. It's a fact, he is like the most brilliant person. Not a lot of common sense sometimes, but he is brilliant. And we love him, and he is, uh, he became a Christian a couple of months after he came to live with us when he first came here as a student at Seacoast Christian Academy. You were the, the uh, valedictorian? Yeah, of course he is. He graduated as valedictorian here. He's on, he has a scholarship at the University of Florida, and um, anyway, he's a part of this church family, so he wanted to share something that he's been, God's been doing in his life, so James. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been feeling God's presence, like, especially, like, during the worship, like, I, like, there were, like, tears in my eyes, actually, like, I was feeling very emotional, and it's been a rough four months that I've been experiencing, but through that, God has been teaching me a lesson, and I just want to share with you guys and try not be too emotional, and can we pray first? Yeah. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Please help opening my heart and share whatever you have for me to share with every one of you, and Lord, please help me. Please help me to comfort me and um, give me peace in my heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, um, all of you guys know the pandemic hasn't been easy for any one of us, right? Like, we have been taking, like, online classes as University of Florida students, and it's a torture, to be honest. First, like, you just have to stay in your room all the time, and if you are going to the campus, you have to wear a mask. And that got me all those acne on my face, yeah. So... Um, so I was trying to, you know, I was getting really bored. I was doing pretty well in school, but I was bored. I felt like I want someone to study with. And then um, there's like an app in um, Apple Store. It's called um, Study Date. So I went on there, and then I was like scrolling. You know how those um, um, apps work, like, you know, swipe left and right. So I saw like um, there's a girl, and then she, um, she's the same major as I am, same year as I am, and we have the same hobbies. We like to go to the gym and listen to the same kind of music. I was like, wow, okay. And then I swiped right on her, and then I just for forgot about it. After four days, she followed me on Instagram, and we started talking. I was like, hey, you want to study together? She was like, yeah, sure, um, why not? Um, and then I um, clicked on her profile. I was like, wow, she's a Christian? That's even better. Okay. 
And then um, we went to study together. And after a couple of dates, we actually started dating. And then um, I went to meet her parents, and we started handing out. And yeah, uh, it's been pretty fun with her, and we've been like sharing a lot of um, our problems, and we could open our hearts to each other. And we eventually became best friends too. And um, just like recently, we decided to break up because she um, uh, drove to my apartment one day and she told me that um, God told her that this relationship had to end. And I was, I was calm. I didn't get too emotional. I was like, um, okay, so why, why is that, do you think? What did God tell you? And she told me that, honestly, in her life, um, she had a Christian family, but nobody actually really believed in God and actually acted like Jesus. And because I was in her life and she saw how her family saw how I treated her and she felt the love of Christ. And she felt like nobody has ever treated her the way I treated her. And then I always talked about God with her. And then she, it made her want to be closer to God more. And God's been telling her to learn more about God before turning to me first. So we decided to um, break things off and just, you know, take some time off dating. And then what she doesn't realize is she taught me just as much as, she, uh, as I taught her. Um, when I was in college, I wasn't so connected to God, and I made mistakes, of course. And then she made me want to learn more about God, and also, like, she made me want to forgive my parents because she always talked about how um, her mom was always being verbally abusive to her, and she had a hard time. She still have a hard time to forgive her, even she's a Christian, and she knows she's supposed to. And her, her, best, her biggest wish is just to let her parents to actually come to Christ and repent their sins, to actually be real Christians. And then I thought of my parents. My parents, they don't even know Jesus that much. They live in China. And I just, I have a hard time to tell them, like, what I feel about Jesus. Because it's really hard to, like, actually express how I feel. And I was just calling them and talking to them about my um, breakup. And then suddenly there was just a verse, Bible verse came to my mind. If you refuse Jesus, you will be tossing to the lake of fire. And Jesus is the only way to everlasting life, which is the kingdom of God. And I told them, and now I was just crying. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> because I have no idea how I can convince them to believe in God. While I know that convincing is not my job because it's God's job, and I have to let him control everything. And I felt so weak, and God let me... God let me realize that without him, I am weak, but with him, I am strong. He gave me all the strength, and I can believe in him, and I can trust him, and I can put faith in him, and he can help me through every situation. So um, I encourage you guys to um, put more faith in God and trusting him more and keep me and my um, ex-girlfriend, her name is Gina, um, in your prayers. Thank you so much. I'm so proud of him. Amen. Okay, so 
he shared with me like yesterday or this, I forget when it was, but anyway, um, how more than anything he is, you know, the awareness that his parents need Christ, that awareness is just heavy on his heart. And I think it's a word for all of us to be this, this awareness that the people around us, especially our family members, those that we know and love, and even our enemies that desperately need to know God. We, and so that should be our focus. Amen. All right. So you kids can go and have a wonderful time. Okay. Um, I want to remind you this uh, Saturday is Men's 222. Lots of good food, fun food and fellowship. And Wednesday night, we are having Bible study and prayer starting at 6 o'clock. We may not have Bible study. We've been basically going into prayer. And many of us are fasting. And uh, we desperately need to fast and pray to hear God on his strategy for the coming year because we're living in a different world. We do not live in the world we used to live in, folks. It's never coming back. There's not going to, there is no, this is the new normal. And I'm, and unfortunate, that's unfortunate, but it's going to happen. So anyway, I want to encourage you to be a part of the remnant that is fasting and praying for our nation. And we need um, God's strategy for how we're going to uh, navigate in the coming year. Uh, real quick, I want to share this. Um, one, I've got a video series about miracles that surrounded the uh, founding of Israel, bringing back the nation of Israel. There were amazing miracles. I've got a video series on it. It's powerful. One of them is how the Israeli soldiers were, uh, ha they were having to cross over this minefield, and the, the, it, I think it was near um, Jordan, and the Jordanian army was there with their tanks and everything, and, but in order to get there, they'd have to cross a, this massive minefield and God supernaturally came and created a massive wind. I've got it on video and it created this wind that stirred up the sand and uncovered every one of the uh, mines. So they could walk through that minefield because they could see where the mines were and it blinded, the sand blinded the Jordanian army. And the, and the result of that video uh, or that miracle of God is that the Israelis were able to win that battle against the Jordanians who now are, have a peace treaty with Israel. And I really believe God needs to blow away the sand. He needs to stir up the winds of the Holy Spirit so that we can see where the minefield is that we're facing in the coming years, year or whatever, because we need to how, how, know how to navigate through the minefield of life. And so that's what we're going to be praying about. I'm praying, and especially that God would give us his clear strategy and direction for the coming year. And as he does that, we will be sharing that with you. But you need to do it for your own family, for your own life. So Wednesday night Bible study, or it's mostly just prayer. So come and join us, the fervent, fiery remnant that is here at the sanctuary. Also, there's an upcoming conference that we're encouraging people to be a part of. It's called Fire 21, January 28th through 30th in Orlando. And it has a children's conference as well. And if you'd like information on that, you can, um, if you got your little bulletin, uh, Danielle Ellison has that information, can help you sign up. Is there any other, did I leave anything out? I did good? I did good, Jenny? Okay. Well, now I'd like you, Pastor Dwight to come up here because he has a word from the Lord. I know that. He had it last week, but, you know, it disappeared off his iPad and I, I had to preach. But this is it. He found it. He found it in his... Here. <laughs> well, Father, we just thank you for Dwight and his heart, his father's heart for the people of God, Lord. He has a truly a father's heart. And so we pray, Lord, that your kingdom would come and your will be done, that you would speak through him to us, that we might capture your vision for the coming year. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That was some great testimonies. It's exciting about my son, too, Rocky, wanting to be with the youth. I, I kind of love the part that he said he's uh, not going to be preaching. Uh, I, I, but I took it in another way. It, it was like, uh, he's not going to be preaching at them. He's going to be sharing with them the word of God. And he's really powerful when he does that. Uh, you know, he gets, uh, so, um, actually I didn't, uh, find my sermon that disappeared 
miraculously. Uh, and, and I think it was a good thing. I told my wife, I said, it, it was a good thing because uh, I was screaming for her at the top of my lungs when it disappeared off my computer. I was going to send it to Joey and it just disappeared. Just uh, like, uh, everything. I worked all day on it. And I was screaming for my wife because I couldn't pull it back. But I wanted her to come and pray for me because I knew where I was at. That's all I wanted. Pray for me because uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. Oh, when she came, she started doing some things. Anyways, turned out she said, you know what? Uh, let me just preach tomorrow. And I'm so glad because it was a great sermon last week and you should go look at that. Um, the herd immunity actually started in my mind. Uh, you know, when I was hearing all this stuff about COVID and um, I was thinking, you know, as some people early on were talking about a herd immunity. Go ahead, get the thing out there. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of a year in captivity. I don't know how long they expected to go on, and now the new miracle drug is uh, a special super uh, vaccine. And, and we, I don't even know where it's going because I've read a lot on it, and there's several types. One you freeze, then there's one you don't freeze, and then there's people saying, hey, uh, COVID can incubate from two days to 14 days. So if you get it and you die, it wasn't the vaccine. You know, so there's all this great buildup on the, the vaccine that's going to save us. And, uh, you know, as Christians, as Christians, we have promises. And when we let fear enter our life, I'm not saying fear is wrong. You know, there's fear of a, a hot stove. You touch the hot stove, it burns you. If it's bringing in awareness, that's good. Like we have mom and dad. Uh, I, I didn't want to go near anything to protect them because mom had had a stroke. So I, I think we need to be wise about things. So I'm not doing any attack, but I was thinking, what happened to the herd immunity? Now, maybe people remember Jacksonville when uh, all of a sudden the young people, when there was some freedom, they charged down, they were drinking, they were partying, and then suddenly Jacksonville was full of uh, COVID. People were going to die left and right. Well, of course, nobody died during that period. It's amazing. All the young people recovered. So I was like, oh, hallelujah. Uh, you know, let's, uh, let's get some more people into the herd. <laughs> and uh, anyways, it got shut down. Uh, all kind of evil was spoken. I was like, it's not adding up for me. But I believe in herd immunity. I'm not talking about COVID or, or these things. I've seen so many diseases. I'm 70-something years old. They have come and went. So uh, I'm not talking about COVID. It just gave me an idea. At first, it was a promising idea, herd immunity, because I've seen it in the scriptures. And that's what I want to talk about today is, uh, believe it or not, it's not COVID. But it's about being immune. You know, when, when uh, sickness or things come, can you be immune? And uh, th there was, um, I will say this, there was a time when miracles happened all over the U.S. And I haven't seen that in a while. I'd like to see that come back. But I can tell you, I, I believe one of the things that, well, no, I'll jump ahead because the herd immunity, I think I have a part one and today's a foundation. Uh, I know I at least have one other sermon that I think would be very exciting, things you've never seen uh, in the New Testament or the Old Testament, or at least I've never heard them talked about, and uh, that will be next. So to begin with, let's look at a herd immunity from the scriptural standpoint. Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, verses 1, 49. Now, the setting of this, we're in chapter 11, but... Noah and the flood has already come. People have been wiped out. And all of a sudden, right after they're wiped out, very first story other than the descendants of uh, Noah was Tower of Babel. So I, I, I wanted to look at that for a reason. It says, verse 1, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. And then we jump down to 4 through 9. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Does that sound familiar, anybody? Okay, 
the world's been destroyed. Adam and Eve are gone. They weren't on the ark. Is that okay? They're gone. Well, Adam and Eve fell for Satan, and he went to Satan and said, hey, you can be like God. So these guys are coming together, and they're saying, hey, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. You know, we're not here to make a name for ourselves. We're here to make a name for the Lord, to shine his glory and bring his promises and his hope. And then it says, otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Now, I call this the first prophecy by heathens. That absolutely comes to pass. Otherwise, we're going to be scattered if we don't do this. Okay? <laughs> so, the Lord says, hey, I'm going to come down and see the city and the tower that people were building. Yeah, the Lord comes down and checks on things. I don't know why. He did it later. Sodom and Gomorrah, he came down. Anyways, he said, oh, we're going to go come down. And the Lord said it. If as one people speaking the same language, see there's one language at this time, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. You know, that, that tells me a lot right there. There's one people speaking the same language. You know, God is not against things being impossible. God is not against us speaking the same language. God wants us. It's not that we can do the impossible, but with him we can. So, but here he's saying, look. They want to make a name. They don't get it. Have they not seen? So he says, come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. I think there's a great confusion today in America. I think even among the churches, they don't even speak the same language anymore. I don't know if they see the same Bible, but God is not a two-headed Madonna, or whatever they want to call that. God has something that he wants his people to hear. And he says, look, we're going to confuse their language. And it says, so here's, here's the end of the prophecy. So the Lord scattered them from there over the earth. The very thing they were afraid of happened to them. And you know, when you live in fear, have we not even seen the scriptures? What you fear will come what? On you. You want to behave like the world? You're going to get what the world has. And we got to line up with what God has to tell us. And he does not want us not to be in unity. He wants us to be in his herd, his sheep. Okay? That's what he wants. He loves us. <laughs> this is why it was called Babel, because the Lord confused their language. And, you know, I just got to laugh. How did God just make everybody speak a different language? He, well, you know what? We can jump over in Acts. He does it in the New Testament. People are speaking languages that they didn't even know about. I don't know how God does what God does. You want to go to an intellectual who's going to give you that answer? Get out of that herd. Get out of it. You know, we're going to get to heaven one day. I'm not even going to ask him that question. Lord, how'd you give everybody a different language? That's not the agenda. It's not the agenda. Now, so I know this. There is power in a unified herd. God knew it. He knows there's power there. He doesn't want people not to know him. Okay, I want you to know that reason of dispersing the people is because they want to be like God. You know, God still cares. Okay, so there's power, and we know it. I love this part of this message. One equals a thousand. You ever heard that one person? You line up with God. You, it's not just you, it's you have the power of a thousand. And what about two? If two people, two people, it's two thousand, right? No, nay, a thousand nays. People are stoning me already. It's 10,000, Dad. Well, it's, 
as Christians, we should know this. When we line up together, and this is the enemy's trick, he's constantly trying to divide God's people. You know what? I don't care if you don't like me, don't like me. I would like you to like me, but that's not my agenda. You water down the gospel when it becomes about you. You know, I, 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 it's, no, no, no. We need to have two of us coming together and having the power of 10,000. In Deuteronomy, it says this. Where some of these things come from? Deuteronomy 32, 30. How could one single enemy chase a thousand? And two, put 10,000 to flight. Now, I want you to hear this. Because this, I think, is a problem with the miracles in America. People started chasing the miracles and left God behind. They were excited about the miracles. But you know what? That's not any new news to me. If you bother to read the Bible, what were the disciples all excited about when they went back? Two by two, they came back reporting to Jesus. Hey, man, even the demon, everybody's running from us. Miracles, miracles. And Jesus had to correct them. Why are you concerned about that? You need to be concerned about your name being in the book of life. And that's what his message is. He wants the people to go to heaven. He just doesn't want to heal us here. He wants to heal us here. But when it becomes about that, and we've lost our focus, we've missed the point. So here's what Deuteronomy says. You can do a thousand or two, ten thousand, but that's not what it says. It says, unless their rock had abandoned them, unless the Lord had destroyed them, we have to line up with the Lord. If we're going against a thousand enemies, it's got to be God. Okay? And if we get all into man, did you see what happened when I prayed? Whoa. You know, that happened to me once. Somebody came all the way to Florida just to see me to say, don't pray over this. Because the word had spread. It went from people hating me for sharing Jesus to people saying, my God, miracles happen when he prays. Well, you know what? I, I, I felt this. Whoa. And you know what? The glory of God left me for a while. You know, it wasn't about the miracles. People are seeking you out for miracles. You better start pointing them to God and let them know. You are worthless without him. He is the one who scatters the enemy. And as long as I line up with him, I can count for the miracles to come. But when you don't line up with him and you're wondering why things aren't happening, you've got to ask yourself, what's happening? James can be the dead. What's happening? What's and we talked. I love James. He, he comes in. He actually asks questions and listens. But you didn't, if you missed why he was weeping, he loves his dad. He doesn't even see a sin in his dad. His mom and dad have given up everything so he can come to America and get an education. They're giving all their funds. He's thinking, what can I share with my dad? And he's sharing with his dad, and his dad starts telling him, oh, here's what the Bible said. James says he was shocked. Then he, but his heart... It's not important to know just what the Bible says. James wants his parents to be in heaven with him. And that is a herd. We need to be herding people to him. That's why he was weeping. You know what God says? If the people aren't weeping over the state of what's going on, put the mark on them. We should be weeping over what's happening to our nation. Not because it's going to affect us, but because of the effect it has on others. The world is suffering. And they're poor. Okay. Unless the rock. Psalm 91.7. Um, I didn't put it in verse 6. So I, I thought, why don't I put it in? But I think God just wanted me to tell you. Verse 6. It's kind of simple. It said, the pestilence. That comes in the darkness. Well, what is pestilence that comes in the darkness? And then the very next thing it says, and the plague that comes at noonday. It's not going to hurt you. Well, I tell you what I think the pestilence is because it's in darkness. What happens in darkness? Evil, sin. It's covered over. It's buried under. 
But the beginning of this wonderful psalm is that he who makes the Lord his refuge. Actually, it says he will be in the shadow of his refuge. If he, if he says the Lord is my refuge. Is that where we're at? Because, it says this then, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. Pestilence, plagues, evil. But you know, two, 10,000. Two people pray. I'm going to tell you something. I feel sorry for those of you who could have been here praying with us on Wednesday and missed it. You know, a lot of times I don't pray because there's so much wonderful prayer going on, but everybody gets a chance. Is it not mountain moving prayer? You know, is it not mountain moving? You know, I, I don't care what's going to happen. We got God with us. But then there's a mountain moving multiplication power. And that's over in Revelations. Thousand upon thousand and 10,000 times 10,000. Because people, I've heard them say this, but they don't even know where it comes from. 10,000 times 10,000 is more than two people times 5,000 jumping up to 10. No, 10,000 times 10. That's a lot of multiplication going on there. Now I can give you the answer in my head. And you can say, well, it wasn't that big of a figure. You know what? If you had an army that size coming against you, you would, you would lose. You would lose. There isn't even an army that size in the entire world. They're talking about a size of a 1 million army. There's 1 million army. You know what? I got an army at my disposal that can destroy everything. But only if I'm in his camp. Only if I'm in his herd. Only if I know my position. So here it is in Revelation 5.11. And, and this John, he said, look, man, I'm going to say it. But it's Jesus saying it. Go back and start in the beginning. So in John 5, it says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels. Numbering thousands upon thousands. It doesn't say. It, what it says is. And. Thousands upon thousands. And. 10,000 times 10,000. You can't just take 10,000 times 10,000. Right James? You're a mathematic. If it says and. It means in addition to. Right? It doesn't mean. Oh. This is a new thing. He saw something so enormous. Yeah, well, he was, he, was, he was a mess in the presence of God. He was saying, hey, put a coal on my lips. I'm so bad. But he was chosen. But here's why knowing that army up there is important. In 91, the same psalm, it repeats something from verse 1. 91, 9 through 10. It repeats what was said in verse 1. It said, if you say the Lord is my refuge... And you make the most high your dwelling. No harm. Can you repeat? That? You don't have to repeat after me. But I would want to be in this group that says, no harm's going to overtake me regardless of what's out there. For he will command his angels. Boy, that's a heck of an army. There ain't no army that big. There's a, he's got a bigger, he can just send one. Because the army that that one would be going against is, is fractional, so teeny. But it says, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Now, if you want that, I'm going to tell you, you got to get in the, in the most high dwelling. So, let's talk about the smallest hurt. Stay connected to him. A herd of one. Who's a herd of one? Anybody got a herd of one? Thank you, Fred. Fred's a herd of one. I'm a herd of one. But stay connected because John 15, 7 says this. Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. I'm going to tell you something. There's a big gap there because things I've heard is, hey, you can just do this and do that. And, and miracles are going to come. No. There's an if clause. An if, and it's a big one. If you remain in me and my words 
my words. You know, I feel sorry. I've told everybody, read the Bible. Faith comes by hearing and the Word of God. So we need to have the Word of God in us. If we have the Word of God in us, we can ask whatever we want. But if you're with Him, see, Jesus didn't come down and say, Lord, I love this party. You know, I'm in control of everything. I don't want to go to that cross. He said, Lord, if you can't remove this cup, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Well, somebody said, well, Jesus and God won. What does that mean? Well, you know what? They were one in purpose. You want to come up here and tell me, well, Jesus is one. God's one. They're one in one. I got all those scriptures. But I think it's uh, his son. He gave up his son just as Abraham did. I don't want to put God in a box because of somebody's theology. Okay? Because what James said is there's only one way to heaven. And that's through Jesus Christ. Because it's his blood that was shed. And I, I, I can't even imagine. I wouldn't let one of my sons die for anybody in this room. Now I might do it. But not my son. Anybody know about that? Simmy, you going to put up your son for me? Now, you might jump in front of a bullet, but not your son. We serve a mighty God, and he is one with the Father. And he's praying, you be one with me, and then with each other, just as me and my dad are one. You know, why are we not getting this? Because it's not about you. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. You got to line up with him. Okay, I, I'm not going to give you the new and better you. I'm not even against that book. I think you can improve yourself, but you're not going to heaven. You better lock on to, I got to line up with him. And it, whenever it becomes all about you, he starts diminishing. Now, I love this. James reads the Bible every day. But James, when you had the breakup with your girlfriend, what James started reading a book about how, you know, what can I do uh, to improve myself? You know, maybe me. It's okay. But it's not okay to abandon God. He needs to be first. So, John 10, 24, Jesus says, The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. You know, I, I hear that in the church today. I don't think the word says that. Can you, can you make it more plain? Because... Uh, I really don't think that applies to me. I'm sorry, it's in the Word. Now, if I grab one scripture out of context, like God says, hate your father and mother, boy, that, that will collapse everything. But he said, in relation to me, you have to put me first. And then he says, you got to honor your mom and dad. you got, you got to cry for them when I'm in heaven with you, James. I was there. I was there. I know what that prayer is like for your parents. No. Tell me plainly what's in the word. Well, read the word. Then we'll talk about it. And please don't bring me one scripture, Dwight. You, you missed this one scripture. You could have made the point with this. We, I had to pray two people out of this church. Every time I preached, they'd come up afterwards and say, man, you should have said this scripture. Finally, I looked at one of them in the presence of the other. I said, I have thrown away more scriptures from this sermon than you can possibly imagine. And what you're telling me was one of them. So please don't greet me. If you're not here to hear what God has to say, I don't want you here. Now, their wives wanted them to stay. And one did. Um, so Jesus answered, I tell you. But you do not believe the works I do in my father's name testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. I tell you, there's a lot of people in the church. They want to say they're Christians, but they don't even understand what the word is. If I talk to them about something, they're like, I don't think that. I'm sorry. 
My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, here's a question. How do you know? Now, he's saying, look, what did he say? Uh, you're my sheep. I know them. You want to know how you know? If you know God, I'm just going to give you one scripture. Because this is very intimate. Jesus says, I know them. You know what? He knows every dark secret you got. That's why he says, confess your sins to one. If it's really bothering you that much, I already know it. But go ahead and confess it. Let's get it out there. Let somebody console you. Let's get back on track. How do you know Jesus' voice? John 2. John, 1 John 2. I don't want to give you my face ID. You got that one up there, Joey? See, I have a little problem. I have a little problem. My laptop, like Connie's, has this sermon on it, but uh, my laptop just dies. Not only does it destroy scriptures, but it's over there dead right now. Yeah, it is. I get a new one. I get a new one on Monday. Don't worry. I was, okay, John. 1 John 2, 3, 6. We know that we have come to know him. Okay? You want to know how you know him? If we keep his commands. Oh, that's in the Old Testament. Well, Jesus said, I'm not doing away with any of those commands. I just give you two. It sums them all up. Okay, but if, does it say if we know the commands? It says if we keep them. Yeah, there's scripture about thou shalt not murder. That's a commandment. Jesus said, if you gossip about somebody, you've already done murder. He kind of upped the ante. He didn't decrease the ante. He upped it. So, he says, if we keep his commands, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a what? And to me, I, I don't get how people miss this. Hey, Jesus, uh, if, I, if I lie... And, and I've said, you're my Savior. I still get to go to heaven, right? It's like, really? Uh, really? Yes, there is a scripture. We'll get to that one. Hang on. Hang on. You don't say that very much, Rose. What is the scripture? Okay. We're going to get to it. Just wanted to be sure. But I had to throw away a lot of more before I got there. But I'm, I'm going to tell you this. I don't want to preach at you. I want to talk with you. So thank you. See, you know the word. It's, I don't know how they missed the word. But anyways, he's a liar and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. Now I want to give you this for a second. People say, well, you shouldn't fear God because perfect love casteth out fear. My response to that has always been, as soon as you get perfect love, you ain't going to be afraid. I still don't make every commandment, folks, but I am trying. I am not dismissing a single word of God. But if you're going to come to me and say, man, you failed commandment number seven, eight, and nine. I'm going to say, what are you doing one, two, three, and four? Because I don't see you around very much. And those are the ones that deal with your relationship with God. And the truth, but if anyone obeys his word, if he obeys it, then love of God is truly made complete in them. And you know what? If you're about your father's business, you don't have to fear. He's with you. But if that's the only scripture you know, perfect love casts out fear. And I have perfect love. Really? Because what I hear coming out of your mouth and what you're doing doesn't line up. Oh, you know what, God? I'm under the blood. Which blood? This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. 
That's a mouthful. But he says, my yoke is easy. Thank God we don't have to go to the cross. I like this one. It's a little thing I read on Facebook. Uh, there was a, a lady, and there was a luncheon at a large church, and these group of ladies were gossiping about the pastor. And one of them said, man, I can't believe he said that. I bet a lot of people say that about me. Well, did you listen to the part over here, the part, or did you just wake up and grab one thing and want to put that on Facebook? Okay. Can you believe he did that? Well, guess who was there? The wife of the pastor. And she said, excuse me, but he didn't say that. And they immediately responded. They retorted, well, you weren't there. How would you know what he said? And the answer was this. Who was the answer? Because I know him. You know, if you're one, your spouse should know you. I love that. That should be our heart. You know, we should know each other. When somebody comes in and says, man, I can't believe he said that. Really? Did you hear everything that was said by this other person before they finally did say this? You, you, you don't want to respond to that because that's who you are. If we know people who are godly, we should stand arm in arm with him. We should not be gossiping. Okay, so do we know him? Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, we will sit on, he will sit on his glorious throne. All of the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Verse 41. Then he will say those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 46, that was 41, 46. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. I want to be with the sheep. How are you with the sheep? You know the shepherd's voice. You follow the shepherd. If you don't know his voice and then you're not willing to follow him, I'm not going to give you all the scriptures. I will tell you, you are a goat. You do not go bah. I don't know what you do. Humbug. I don't know. Bah humbug. I don't know. Maybe that's the sheep of the goat. Okay. That's free. Revelations 21, 7 and 8. Your verse, Rose. You want to jump up there? You want to sing it for me? I love the Revelations, Revelations. 21, 8, 21, 8. Liars go to... Okay. Oh, you haven't been with children's ministry. This is a children's ministry. This is a... Ch you were with children's ministry. No. Liars go to hell where they burn forever. Burn, 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 burn. Anyways, it's a funny one with the kids. Uh, anyways, here's what 21.8 says. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral... Those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Connie thinks the biggest one today is cowards. You know, cowards. You know, the, the battle starts raging and people start, oh my gosh, I better get out of here. I don't want to be associated with these people. Well... Get in the herd you want to be in. You know, uh, the herd of God will grow with or without us. Jesus 21, 21 says this. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt. Not only can you do what has was done to a fig tree, he had smited a fig tree. Jesus did. He just spoke at it. He said, you ain't giving any fruit. If I come back here later and you ain't got any fruit, I'm going to. Smite you. But also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. 
Jesus said, and I will, in 14, 13 through 14, Jesus said, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name and I will do it. That's pretty good. But you know, when you're lining up with good, with God, he wants you to have your daily bread. He wants you to be okay. But there's bigger things we can pray about. And that's what we do here on Wednesday night. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In 2 Timothy, for God hath not given us a spirit of what? Fear. So he's saying, hey, if you're a coward... If you're afraid of everything, you don't have my spirit in you. But of power and of love and of sound mind. Now, I think there's a time when you sound the alarm. Okay, that's okay. Why do you sound an alarm? It's like me screaming. Connie, Connie, come here. I needed my wife's prayer. I, I know she has a main line to God. Maybe I could get everything back. Okay, so anyways, there's a time when you call and say, will you pray for this person? Will you pray for my loved one? Will you do this? Well, what made you do that? Other people come up and say, you know what? We already prayed about that. God answered it. I'm like, please get away from here. Please, please. I, I agree with you. But we are praying for a reason. And he said, well, God's already done it. I know that scripture too. There they are in the bed right in front of me. Well, you don't see with the eyes of God. Okay. Did he say pray uh, never unceasingly or, or not? Is that scripture in there? Oh, oh, well, yeah, but that doesn't apply to this situation. Well, if you're in that bed, you want somebody praying for you. You know, come on. Come on. You know, this comes from years of being in the Christian church and hearing bad stuff. 1 John 4, 4, you dear children, I love it, God calls me his child. He calls you his child, he calls you the apple of his eye, come on. You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one in you is greater than the one in this world. Okay, you know what, I'm not going to go any further, uh, I got some exciting stories about some of the herds. I, not, not all the stories in the Bible. That'd take forever. But I got some real good stories. Here's a funny story. You remember about the time the herd of people who were heathens lined up with God and were spared. You remember that one? Oh, next week you have to wait. Okay, some of you. Oh, no. A thousand days. I'll have to take Nineveh out of my things like say, Connie didn't know what I had in the scripture. I'm not insecure. Yes, it's Nineveh. And they were bad folks. Anyways, that's next week. Um, along with other herds where people lined up, big herds. I want you to know this as we go away. God and you are a majority. Um, a herd of two is pretty incredible. If I had to ask you, and I will now, what is the herd of two that Satan attacks the most? Marriages, thank you, husbands and wives. If you want to look around the world, 50% divorce rate today, 50% of divorce rate in the church. And you know, people in the church getting divorced and say, well, I'm a Christian. Really? And then they'll say, well, Dwight, you got a divorce? Yeah, I was a heathen. I thought about it when I was married. Connie thought about it. We went through some rough times, didn't we? We said some terrible things to each other, didn't we? Didn't we? It was never, never did I say I will. Never did I say I'll leave you and forsake you. Okay, I'm not going to say that here. I was a mess. You don't come from a non-Christian family and not come with some baggage, you know, especially when you're hearing bad stuff. Anyways, so you already know the power of two. 
So I'm not going to give that story next week, but I will tell you, it says don't let the sun go. Who's saying that? Okay, everybody knows that. I love it because if we all know it, why don't we practice it? And by the way, somebody says, you can't be angry. Oh, yes, I can. It says, be ye angry and sin not. If something doesn't anger you out there, I don't know where you're from. Maybe you've been staying home under COVID. I don't know. But there's things out there that trouble me. But, you know, the only ones I want to deal with is the ones in the church. Because if we get unified, if we understand the power we have, we can prevail. And I want you to see that. I want you to see that from great men and women. Women in the Bible. Anybody know a woman who made a herd and changed the tide? I don't even have it in my scripture. Anybody know one? Esther was the one that came to my mind. And I'll tell you what she said. And Connie said it. But very few people here have done it. I'm just going to lay it out. Mordecai. Great man of God came and said, hey, if you don't do this, God will find another. After all, I'm your uncle. I raised you. Everybody else left you, but I was with you. She said, well, let me pray about it. So she says, you know what? Um, I get it. And if I die, I die. I'm going to go before evil. What you said is evil. And the, her, her husband wasn't evil. But anyways, this is the end of that one. I don't want to give it, but um, she said, uh, but here's what me and my maidens are going to do. What did she say we're going to do? Uh, fast and pray. Oh, wait a minute. Can't I just say, uh, uh, God, uh, uh, will you take care of this? Okay, we prayed about it. No, she said, we will fast and pray. Jesus said, these kind of demons only come out by fasting and praying. We better get a hold of when it's serious and when it's not. And if your leader says you need to fast and pray, because you know what Esther did? She basically said to Mordecai, I am now the leader. And she said, we will do this, but you will too. You don't ask me to go on the field of battle. I'm a woman. And you don't want to obey God? Have you not seen? Yeah, Mordecai didn't start off with saying... You know what, we're going to fast and pray. No, he was like, if you don't do this, got to raise another. So I think our comment was pretty good. If you don't do this, God will bring another. We need to be in God's herd. And God gave us these wonderful promises. Women can totally affect a man. You know what? Connie's told me so many of my sins. I, I hated it when she'd tell me. I was the son who would say, no, I won't do it. But I went away and thought about it. I came back. Sometimes, right? Occasionally. Okay. There you go. Okay, so we're bearing everything. You know what? I don't want to go to the church where the pastor stands up and says, do you know who I am? I am the best godly man you've ever seen. We need to knock that stuff off. God is God, not the person up here. Speak the word. Call the people into repentance for things they're not doing so that they can win the day. So that they can win the day. He doesn't want any of us lukewarm. Those days are over, folks. If We should have been in the battle over here. And we can still. My Bible says... If God be for you, okay. all I have to do is line up with him. God's for me when I'm with him. So we got to get anger, hatred, all that stuff gone. We need to be like him. And he says what love is. So you can go re research those. I didn't even put them in there. Too many scriptures. Too many scriptures. So next week, we're going to hear some great stories about herds and why. Why these herds were victorious. By the time we get to the third sermon, you will see something that I don't think you've ever seen before in your life. And I will tell you, the church is rampant with this. And it's talked about, but it's kind of swept under because people make excuses. You know what I'm not going to do anymore? I used to make ex excuses, but I'm not God. God doesn't want excuses. God wants his people to win. 
And when you see that we're not winning, we need to step up our game. And this is the last thing I'll say, but it's not political. Some of you are going to read it that way, but it's not. When Joe Biden said, when I become president, one of the first things I will do is make it legal for an eight-year-old to choose to change his sex. You know what? I heard a lot of Christians, they don't care about abortion. They don't care what a person stands for. They say, well, you know, he's going to do a great thing for the country, and I don't like this other guy. Whatever. Whatever your, your deal is. Whatever cooks your boat. But when you hear sin, if you don't think that's a sin, just so you know, because most of you are not all wise, God doesn't show you everything, does he? You may be wiser than me in 99, but God does show me some things. He showed me in California, they tried to pass a law that said molestation of children by an adult is a sexual orientation. Now, I think most of you were asleep because you never saw that. Maybe you're watching TV. Maybe you were listening to the, the other things, but the, God's been sending signals. But I can tell you what hasn't happened. Pastors don't preach that because people will leave. And I'll show you a scripture in the New Testament of where, but we can change all this. Why, why, why was that even important? Um, because a judge passed a rule last year. He passed, he, he ruled that a young man, a young child of eight years old, can make the choice of their trans, of their sex. Eight years old can make that choice. You still don't see it. If you can make the choice at eight years old, child molestation goes right out the door because all they have to say is he or she made the choice. And I've been in churches where they say, how many of you were raped as a child? The first time it happened, hands went up everywhere. I wept. I wept. And it wasn't just girls. Guys were raped. You want to pass a law. It says it's okay. An eight-year-old can make the choice to have sex with somebody who's molested them. What I read is children are too afraid to come forward. They feel guilty. What have I done? What's the matter with me? They're threatened. They're intimidated. There's a sickness in our land. We have forgotten our children. We kill our children. If we're not praying about this, you know, God doesn't say you will win the day. He says he'll win it. But if you don't want to call out to him, if you don't care about a child, if you want to say an eight-year-old child can make the decision to have sex, I'm going to say this. You are sick. Does anybody agree with what I just said? Just raise your hand and say, hey, you know what? I want to be in the herd that does not agree that an eight-year-old can make sexual consent. And once you agree to that, you now know who you serve. And you have set by, me included. We have not called others on the carpet when we should have. But you know, it's not too late. It's not too late. We may not see what we want to see, but we need to stand with God. And we need to be able to say to people, you know what? You can't call yourself a Christian and throw a child under the bus. You can put up all the billboards you want. But as for me in my house, I serve the Lord. And if that bothers you because you think, you think I would storm the Capitol. No, they made Christians out to be terrible people and we're not we are the light in the darkness they don't even know it we're praying for them we don't want one to perish that's what God said I'm against the faith that says you have no choice you know God decided early on that you go to heaven and you don't I can grab those scriptures but if you're going to preach that my Bible also says he doesn't want a single one to perish he may not like some of them for what they're doing, 
but he wants them to repent and change. But before we go there, we're going to have to look at ourselves. We need to repent. We need to change. And things that we see, once our ears start saying, well, that doesn't mean anything. And you know what? You don't have to attack people. You know. But Jesus did overchange the money changers in the temple. He didn't go out except for, you know, the only people I really remember him calling into account was those who wanted to be called pastors, preachers. I don't remember him going up to somebody who's in the pew. I think he said, man, they're the sheep. You need to be telling them the truth. You are a whitewashed person. And you know what? Pastors in America need to become one with God. If you think I'm not tempted, you are sorely mistaken. But God doesn't tempt any of us. We need to take control of any of our thoughts, take those captive and line up with every one of his thoughts. And pretty soon, whatever was tempting you, you'll be able to laugh at. But the first step is discipline. And I'm going to tell you, the first step is discipline. And I am sorry that the church has a 50% divorce rate. We should be weeping over that. Now, some of you don't take the guilt on, please. You know what? I, this, as I begin to close, which is right now, I met a pastor. My wife was there. He was on the bus with his wife. They kind of have this strange belief that nothing in the, the first four books d- does not apply to us. Nothing Jesus said applies to us, only from Acts on. And along with that belief, they believe if you walk the aisle, confessed, there you said Jesus is Lord, that from there on out you're going to heaven. So that's a backdrop to a large church and a pastor, and they're on the bus with me. And the wife opens up. You know, you know, when you're a light in a darkness, people are attracted to you. The wife wasn't going to speak against her husband, but she was hurting. And she tells me this story. She says, you know, my son-in-law just came home with another woman. And went into my daughter and said, we need to have sex together. Son-in-law was leader of music. Angel of light. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. She said, we thought he knew God. But there were signs and nobody said anything. So I went outside. My heart was breaking. What could I say? What could I do? Pray. God's not going to make that husband change. He has to make that choice. But I did pray. So I saw the husband. And I said, man, my heart breaks for you. He said, why? I said, well, the, your son-in-law that you made head of music brought home a, another wife, wanted to have sex. Yeah, that's okay. I said, what? And he says, uh, I says, and I looked at him and said, you don't think he's still saved, do you, at this point? Oh, yes. You can never lose your salvation, no matter what you do. And I said, do you have any comforting words for your wife? Because what you just told me is not out of the Bible. Well, I can prove it. I said, so can I. I can prove anything out of the Bible. I can prove everybody goes to heaven. And I can prove there's a remnant. But you better choose because my sheep know my voice. The sexually immoral do not get in. You know, I I would at least give a warning. You can't live like this and expect to live like this. It, 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 the story will not end well. I would give that kind of speech. You know, you can't touch hot coals and not get burned. Yeah, well, where's the friends that should have went to him and said, what are you doing? You're getting ready to lose the best thing you've ever had. What are you doing? Big church, head of music, nobody knew it. Come on. I don't want to be that church. I know you don't either. So anyways, one, power of one, but if If you have the voice and you don't say anything, if you don't say, if you think you're standing on solid ground, be careful. Be careful. I don't want to be that guy who says, man, 
uh, come to me. My prayers are going to be answered. I want to be the guy that says, come, pray. God's going to bring you the answer. God will heal your marriage if you'll let him. God will heal your sickness. Oh, well. Next week, hold on tight. Uh, week three, and I haven't even wrote it yet. It's my head, what in your head is, I have all these great things that God showed me, and I, I, I believe he showed me, but you'll have to, you'll have to test it. You know, you know, you can take this word, and my Bible says you get to go to the Bible and search it out. You can go and say, you know, I, I don't like that he spoke against the theology. I'm not speaking against the theology. I don't, I don't even, ha I don't have a theology. I have a Bible, you know. Well, I was always told this. Well, I understand how you felt. I've had those feelings, but what does the word say? Well, I can show you it proves this. Well, can we look at all the scriptures? Have you ever had that guy come to your door, knock, knock? I want to show you this, what the scriptures say about this. Okay, I'll let you go first, but I get to go second. Okay, don't come to my house to preach at me and think you're going to get to preach unless I'm in sin. If you know me and you've seen a sin, come on in. But be careful. I may write in the sand. I may know things about you that you don't even think I know. Be careful that you don't get the speck out of somebody's eye. We need to be do it, dealing with planks. Let God deal with the other stuff. Anyways. Lord, uh, anybody want to say anything? Otherwise, I don't feel like I was preaching at you. Huh? I'm, I'm closing. Connie wants to pray some, for some people. Is that okay? Is that good? Then I'll be here. Or... If you have any need for prayer after the service, please come forward. But you know, God's Jesus said my house was a house of prayer. It's supposed to be my father's house. Supposed to be a house of prayer. Sometimes that's the biggest thing we we mostly neglect in the church today. So right now we have a lot of need. Who else has got COVID? Carrie. Okay, we have some. People in our own church, uh, Carrie has, and I think her son has COVID. Scott Melanson, Father Melanson from He's Church of Messiah. He's one of the good guys. He's in the hospital with it. My nephew, uh, who lives in Missouri, is not doing well with COVID. So I want to just lift up these people. Father God, we come before your throne of grace with a grateful heart for your promises to us, God, that we can dwell under the shelter of the Almighty. Under the shadow of your wing, O oh God, and find safety. But God, there are those who are afflicted right now with this man made germ warfare plague. And Father, we lift them up to you, Carrie and her son, and Scott Melanson, and Chad Guerra, my, my um, cousin's husband, Mike, and my aunt, Amina. There are so many people, Lord, who are affected by this plague. And we ask God for your divine intervention in their lives. That you would cause their heart, their, their bodies to be healed. But more importantly, Lord, that you would use this time of sickness to draw them near to you, O oh God. Touch their hearts and heal them from the inside out. Heal them from the inside out, Lord. And we pray for your divine protection over President Donald J. Trump, for his family, and for all those who have stood with him in this hour of great trial for our nation. Dear God, we pray for your mighty warring angels to surround them and protect them from every attack of the enemy, from the deep state, from the FBI, the CIA, and, and foreign intelligence, and every other evil thing every hidden thing god we thank you god that you are a big god much bigger than they are and you are able to do the impossible so we release these wonderful people the trump family and all those senator cruz 
and the attorneys who have been tr seeking to bring justice and truth to light, God. We pray for your divine protection over them, Father. And we pray for your mercy over this nation. We do not deserve it. The church has failed you. We have failed, oh God, to speak truth in the pulpit. We have al allowed and enabled and empowered those who call themselves Christians to stand with evil when they go to the polling places or even refused to take the time to vote. Lord, we don't deserve your mercy, but we know that your mercies are new every morning and we rely not on our own righteousness, but on yours alone. We pray, God, have mercy on us. Forgive us for our sins. Deliver us from evil and use us for your perfect plan and purpose in the earth. Give us a passion for the things you are passionate about, Lord, that we may seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. Let our lives be a light in the darkness and a funnel of your love and blessing to those who desperately need to know you. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If you have any, yes.